asset management. And I think what makes us unique is that we do everything from buying the facility, raising the capital, doing the operational improvements to the operation of the asset itself. And then we allow investors to participate alongside of us in our deals. I think that's awesome, man. So you touched on probably five or six things that we could talk about <laughs> how we're those things, but um, we met in Hawaii not that long ago at uh, another mastermind type meeting, and uh, there was a lot of other presenters in there. But you stuck out as uh, you know. I I always love people that are extremely intelligent, but also funny. And I thought you gave, gave a really good presentation. <laughs> you you kept everybody interest. You didn't make it dull, but I could also tell you're extremely intelligent and you were out there and you're just doing stuff. So, you know, for me, just dealing with a lot of different personality types, I think it's interesting because I do come across a lot of people that will come up to me and they'll go, I got a great idea. I'm going to do new construction and mobile home parks and storage units and property ma- and all these things. And I'll be like, you're not going to do anything because you're going to think about <laughs> you never actually dig in, but you're actually doing all of it. So a few things that stuck out for me is a lot of other people were looking at res looking at multi you're one of the few people that I've talked to recently that are really uh, driving it at home on the asset class of storage units. And I also get a lot of people that always dabble a little bit in mobile home parks. I don't really come across too many people that like, it's just that their thing, but I really want to hear about both. But, um, you know, backing it up first, um, what markets are you investing in? And is, uh, we'll touch on the asset classes too, because I know there's different variations of that, but where are you based out of? Where are a lot of your projects? Yeah, so our headquarters is in Golden, Colorado. That's where we have an office and we have, I believe now, 10 people working out of the corporate office. And then we have uh, properties in Washington State, Colorado, and Texas. And we even have a deal that we're just kind of money partners in, but don't directly operate in Michigan. So we're kind of in those those, those, uh, three states. But we target properties on that in MSAs that are fastly growing or have good market characteristics. And those property, those are investment criteria are actually at spartanmap.com. We actually look at about 150 different cities across the United States out of the, I don't know, 4,000 cities. We've targeted kind of the, the ones that fit our business model, which is we look for cell storage facilities that we can build from the ground up or that we can buy with existing cash flow in place and expand uh, the facility with the demand and the pricing in the market that allows us to complete our business plan. I think that's really cool. And again, I, it's probably one of those niches that if people are very competitive on multifamily or very competitive on residential, you're finding your own little niche that I'm assuming um, there's analytics that go into it like everything else. But are you finding that it's a little bit of a hidden asset that a lot of people are passing over in their markets when they're looking for good long-term cash flow? Absolutely not. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That that was uh, kind of the thought was, man, everybody's talking about, you know, being an apartment investor and everybody's now a capital raiser and everybody's doing deals and, you know, buying units and expanding. And we're, you know, so when we looked at storage, we kind of thought, well, no one's talking about self-storage. And uh, in our little like social circles and in our real estate meetups and things like that. And that's just because really self-storage doesn't hold a candle to the wind as far as how many facilities actually exist. There is about 55,000 facilities nationwide, which is a lot. It's actually more than Burger King, Starbucks, McDonald's combined. But wow. yeah, but the, you know, multifamily, I mean, there is multifamily. There's, you know, millions of properties in the United States. And so you hear about multifamily a lot more. You hear about apartments a lot more, um, but it's just as competitive or more competitive than multifamily. Uh, when you start kind of getting into the space of self-storage, you realize that there are a lot of people that know what you know, and they are looking for good properties. And actually, one of the things that they brought up at the economic summit this year in Las Vegas at the Self-Storage Association was that 2018 and 2019 will probably go down as the most frustrating year for acquisitions in a space because there's so many people looking for the right project and there's just overpricing in the market, cap rate, compression, and just a oversaturation of supply in a lot of micro markets. So it's, it's been a very difficult year because we have very strict criteria. Like you mentioned earlier, what we're doing is we're raising the capital. So we're accountable to our investors. We're also finding these deals and making sure that they can expand and have the potential to fill up but we're also doing our own market study 
And what we find is, you know, we look at about a thousand self-storage projects a year and we buy about three to four. Wow. Uh, this year, unique. Yeah. <laughs> so there's quite a vetting process. Uh, we're looking for something very specific. Um, but once we kind of, you know, we, that's, what's really helped us, I think, grow is that we we're very niche focused. We know exactly what we want. So as soon as something comes across our desk, you know, we can usually eliminate it within a couple of minutes, um, if it doesn't fit our criteria. And if it does, you know, we we can move very swiftly to make sure that we can put together the deal to, to get it done. Um, and that's why we've had a a hundred percent contract close rate. We've actually never failed on a contract because we we really know what we're looking for. So when we see it, when we say we're going to buy it, say we're going to go through with it, uh, we execute. Yeah, man, I think that's awesome. And you touched on something there that I think a lot of people get in trouble with is the discipline of of having very strict criteria and not really getting emotional and varying from that because you're striking out on some deals or things aren't fit your criteria. So I feel like initially people get a pretty good grasp of this is what I need to make a good deal. And then they'll get 20, 30, 40 offers rejected and go, well, now I just kind of want to buy something. And especially <laughs> yeah. with the like, you know, cap rate compressions and volatility out there. And there's a lot of competition out there. Now is really not the time where you want to really get flexible on that. Cause I feel like that's where a lot of people are going to get in trouble. So I like talking to people that are successful in, the, in, in any realm of business, whether it's, you know, business or athletics or that that's part of why I started doing the podcast. And I found that being disciplined about the right choice or if it's a fighter, the right fighter, whatever it may be, is really an important part of being an entrepreneur or test is knowing what to swing, swing at. What can you give as far as insight for going through that process? And, you know, how do you deal with that? Because I'm sure there's times when you're looking at a thousand and you're buying three or four, you know, it, it could get frustrating sometimes. It could beat you down sometimes. and You might want to have that. How are you personally dealing with those, that, that type of struggle? And just, I mean, it seems like there's even more, um, more rejection in your business than there is in multifamily and residential. It, let me just say that from experience, it's much harder to have a bad deal in your portfolio and have, and be dealing with that than it is not to. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's really not fun to be in a bad deal. And if you're in a good deal, it's a lot of fun. And it's, I know it's frustrating when you're looking at, you know, lots and lots of properties and your criteria is strong and you're sticking to your guns, but stick to your guns because, you know, it, you know, it's just something that if you start swaying on your criteria and you get into a bad project, there's tons of downstream effects. Number one, you're not going to be looking for any more projects anymore because now you're going to be tending to your bad deal. Number two, the investors that you brought along for that bad deal uh, now don't trust that the next deal you bring them is going to be any good. You know, number three, now you thought you were unmotivated before. Now you're really not motivated because <laughs> you're spending all this time on a property and trying to sell, you know, t trying to solve issues with that versus growing your company and growing your business. So you really have to stick to your guns and make mistakes and fail fast because you know what happens is is you if you don't have that criteria then you're just going to be buying whatever and and then you're or maybe you get a great deal and it's just too small of a deal and now you're spending a lot of time managing it you know that's why we don't look at anything less than 20,000 square feet because we don't want to be in the business of running a, a storage facility we want to be in the business of buying good ones that have great returns that we can put frontline management at and if you know, if we can justify that in the financials, then we can hire a frontline employee. Now we have resources that we can rely on to run that business. And it becomes more passive in that sense, um, you know, because we have somebody who can actually work the front desk and take care of the facility. But if you're, you know, you know, I used to get, you know, a lot of emails from people and they say, Hey, look at this, look at this uh, 5,000 square foot facility in the middle of nowhere. And it's got 80 units. And isn't this great? It's so cheap. You know, it's $200,000 or, 300,000. And, you know, and I just think, oh my God, what a nightmare. I'm going to have to drive to it. And, you know, it's going to make, you know, 50 bucks a month or whatever it's going to make me after I pay all my expenses and debt. And so you just, it's a balance of like a good project. What is worth your time coming up with an investment thesis? And let me tell you, it is really, really frustrating. And I have to give compliments to my business partner, Scott, who has high priorities or high, uh, um, you know, standards for Spartan as the CEO to make sure that we're not making any bad decisions. 
Um, and then, you know, even though our, you know, to the demise of our acquisitions team, Ben, um, you know, it's frustrating because you see all these deals, you go through them all, you're trying to make it work and you just, you know, the diamonds are, are definitely in the rough there. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's frustrating and it's difficult, but then it's super rewarding when you start getting good deals in your portfolio, they start cash flowing to your investors, people get excited, they tell other people and you start having good performance and good success. And then you just become, you kind of have this aura of being a due diligent, good deal, good communicative company because you can really focus uh, because you put the right deals in your portfolio. So I think that's awesome, man. That, that's, that's huge. Um, you, you reminded me of a couple of things there too. So now touching on the teams, what types of teams do you have in place for that or for your business in general? Because it looks like you have a couple of different, obviously you have your property management, you have your construction, but as far as an acquisitions team, what are you doing for something like that? Because again, they're, they're working a lot and they're only seeing a handful of deals a year. Um, and the second part of that is how did you scale into that? What, where did you start? Because I'm assuming like, I don't really know many people that just started with self storage. They got into residential. And um, so I do want to hear a little bit about the journey of how you came to that and what made self storage the asset class for you to go after. Yeah. So the way we got into it was uh, residential. So we were flipping houses in DC and my, I lived on the block. My neighbor moved in next door. There was a vacant house in between us. And uh, that neighbor next door turned into my business partner, Scott, and we started a company. And we started with that first flip in between us. And after that, we just kind of scaled. Um, we were doing, we did four flips on just on that one block. And then we did other projects, condo conversions, land development, things like that in Washington, D.C. But, you know, after a while, we realized there's so much effort that goes into flipping a house, building a new house. And it's kind of like, you know, you're opening the door a lot and closing it. So you're doing a lot of settlement, a lot of transactions, a lot of things, you know, for the amount of effort you're doing and the profit and the scalability of it all. And we also saw kind of the market turning, you know, so in 2017, you know, we did our last residential. Now residential is still doing fine. <laughs> we you know very late here in 2019. Um, but, you know, we also kind of thought what asset class was recession resistant last uh, uh, downturn and the downturn before. And if you look at how the asset classes performed over 20 years, there's two asset classes that stuck out as top performers during downturns. And that was medical office and self storage. So medical office obviously is, you know, you still got to go to the doctor. So the doctor is still going to be able to pay their rent and they're still going to have their customers. Um, and then self storage depends on life events. So, you know, whether you're upside upsizing or downsizing, you're going to have that. So that was kind of our journey into the asset class. We just sort of, realize that, you know, this isn't all about wholesaling or flipping because, you know, the local RIAs say that there is so much more to this and it's not just multifamily either. And we just really didn't like that multifamily. We wanted to have control over the process. We you know we had personal bad experiences with property management groups. So we're like, what asset class can we be in that we have control over the whole process so we can do a really good job of it. And that was assets that were easy to manage, easy to maintain, and easy to evict. And that, and self-storage, again, number one, right? It was good in the last downturn. It's, it meets those three criterias. And we just learned as much as we could about the asset class and went into that asset class. So I think that's awesome. So since you've went into that asset class, I know you're doing mobile homes as well. Are you completely <laughs> out now on other things? Because the big thing I see is, you know, having the focus on a specific thing. So is that really where your company is focusing on right now is mobile home parks and storage units? Yeah, that's exactly right. And storage is kind of the top priority at the moment. So we are looking a hundred percent at storage. The RV park thing kind of came along um, sort of circumstantial to looking at another deal that fell apart. And the broker brought us an RV park that was, uh, I think it was like a 17 or an 18 cap when we were looking at it. And we've reverted it to a 42 or a 43% cap rate on purchase. Oh, wow. And so we're like, man, this is, this is a pretty cool asset class. Um, and nobody's in it. You know, everybody's talking about mobile home parks. Everybody's talking about storage, multifamily, office retail, shopping centers. People are doing all those asset classes. And so especially storage and multifamily, you have cap rate compression because you have lots of available financing. Everybody can get a loan on those assets. Everybody wants to own multifamily and self-storage. 
but RV parks, nobody's really there. So the lending environment is very difficult and the buyer pool is very difficult. So we have huge cash flow in those asset in that asset class. So we own a couple of RV parks, um, uh, just over 200 units of RV parks in Texas. And we're going to be expanding one of the parks by a hundred units actually in early 2020. So we are going to have, you know, quite a bit of, uh, uh, RV, uh, park space in our portfolio. And that, that's really what drove us to us. So think of it this way. I mean, you got, you know, a hundred units of RV parks and this is long-term extended stay. There's different RV parks. This isn't like a campground you go to on the weekend. This is where people live. And they pay anywhere from six hundred to nine hundred dollars in lot rent per month, so it's extremely high lot rent. And all you're really providing that person is uh, electric pedestal, um, uh, water, and septic, and maybe some internet. And some of our facilities they pay for it, but in our case, of them they um, the tenant pays for it. So, and you have no maintenance, you have no obligation to the RVs. Uh, you're just renting the pad space. So the the expense to gross income ratio is really low. We, you know, we're paying, I think our, our operating expense ratio is like 35%. So we're really collecting a lot of the revenue and it's uh, just a great asset class. And the other thing is, is there's not a lot of sophisticated operators in that space. So with our property management um, expertise and ability to sort of run our own assets, we can do these all over the place and really kind of have an upper hand, um, especially when you're competing basically everybody's a mom and pop operator in the space. So it's uh, it, it's just a kind of a niche and nobody's talking about it. Nobody's doing it. So then that's why the, you can get a, you can get a great deal on them. And um, you know, I, you know, I don't, it's not that we're trying to be trendsetters or anything, but you know, we kind of look at the ability of our team to run and manage and expand and, and do CapEx improvements on these mixed with our ability to study, study a market and understand where the supply and demand is really going and being able to raise the capital and not having any restrictions on private debt or equity. It's just a nice uh, setup for us um, to really, you know, fund cash flow. Cause I think, I think a lot of multifamily syndicators when they're looking at getting a, at buying an apartment building or raising funds to do that, they don't realize that they're really not going to make any money on cash flow. There is no cash flow when you're buying a six cap or a five and a half percent cap and you're raising money from investors and you're paying them a pref. Yeah, you might make your acquisition fee or you'll make some fees up front. But after that, there's nothing until the end. So, but the thing about an RV park, you buy an RV park at a 15 or a 16% cap rate, you're going to have, you're going to hit your pref and you're going to have cash flow. So you'll actually earn a, a distribution. You'll actually be getting your split on top, which has been very beneficial to the growth of our company. I've said a lot there. So, so. no, that's outstanding though. That was really interesting to me. So what, what types of, what types of deals are you looking at now? You, you touched on, there's not a lot of sophisticated investors or operators, I'm sorry, in that realm. And I know a lot of the guys on the multifamily side, that's exactly where they find a lot of good deals is by the mom and pop operators who haven't done a good job for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They don't have the money to now do the deferred maintenance. So it turns into a good deal. They get a lot of seller finance type deals um, coming with investor cash, able to buy them out. Um, how are you finding these types of, of parks? And then my, my follow-up question to that is now, are you buying the RVs and then renting them out the spots or are you just renting out the lots and they're bringing their own RVs in? They're bringing their own RVs in. Okay, cool. E- easy to manage, easy to evict, <laughs> easy to maintain, right? If we own a bunch of trailers, <laughs> that's not easy to maintain. Um, I mean, it might be, it might be, you know, you get a guy out there that knows what he's doing and he can fix up the stuff, but you know, we don't, but then you got to have a guy to do that. Right. And, uh, you know, and then when he quits or moves on or can't work or something, um, you know, then you don't have that guy anymore. Then you have a bunch of maintenance problems. So we just, you know, we like that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, finding these things, you know, you, you're looking for the, you know, depressed properties. We just look for good opportunities. I mean, we honestly don't really, I mean, the cap rate's great, but we don't really care about the cap rate. It's more about what you can do with it. I mean, when we bought, our last um, RV or two RV parks ago, we, we didn't even really, I mean, if you looked at the cap rate on the actuals, you would have been like, Oh, this isn't a 17 cap. This is like a, you know, this is terrible. This is like a six or a 7% cap. But what we did was we, we figured out that the market, every other operator, every other facility was full. It was just, this one was so poorly managed that all we had to do is come in there, clean up the staff, you know, fire, hire, 
kick out bad tenants, kind of turn around the property. And our pro, and our pro forma on actuals was going to, or uh, pro forma on what we could do with the property is was incredible. So we just got in there, saw the vision, and and went with it. Um, and that's I, I think really kind of important too. Is I think people get a lot of you know people get obsessed with cap rates, and it should. You know, I mean, you should pay for what it's actually doing. Uh, but sometimes it's more about an opportunity um, based on market demand, and that's something that we'll uh, kind of get our hands around. Sure. Yeah, and I think when you're playing in the cap rates that are up in the double digits you don't have to be as cautious with it. Whereas like you're saying in the multifamily, somebody's getting a five or a six or a seven it's, and you're bringing an investor money and you're paying them a seven or an eight. You just did the whole thing for no money minus your acquisition fee. So I think that's a really good point. Uh, it's funny because you actually went, ah, it's, it's terrible. It's a seven, but I know people that are in bidding wars now trying to get buildings in good areas that are at a seven cap. So it's interesting to see the difference there. I think that that's a really cool difference in some of the asset classes that you're finding versus what everybody else is going for. You're doing a little bit of the opposite and it's, it's leaving a lot of meat on the bone. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we've seen sub four cats in storage. So, I mean, storage is trading between, you know, five and six and a half cap in most markets, you know, good markets, good, you know, either primary, you know, secondary, maybe even tertiary market. So that's where, that's where it's trading depending on the asset type and how big it is and how, you know, how well run it is and things like that. But, but yeah, I mean, storage, it's, you know, we've never, we've never split the pref on storage. We've hit the pref for our investors, but you know, split on top is nothing. You, you know, it's really hard to do. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know how much, uh, you know, kind of background you have in syndication, but I've even noticed what some syndicators are doing are they're actually over raising the amount of money that they need on a project. And they're actually doing a distribution every quarter, or every month. Um, but really it's not a distribution. It's just a, it's a return of capital. So it looks like a distribution, <laughs> but it's not a distribution. And I, I just kind of, I look at that and I go, wow. I mean, that's really, I mean, not only is the syndicator not making any money off the deal, but the passive investors aren't, aren't making off the deal while they're operating it. Now, when they sell, there could be a profit and a split and all that, but, but they get this check in the mail and they and I, I kind of looked into that a little bit more and I'm like, man, this isn't even a return on capital. It's a return of capital. And there's a huge difference. And I think, I don't think people are really realizing that. So it's not even, some of these deals aren't even cash flowing to investors. Now, again, it all depends on, that could still be a good deal. You just have to look at the business plan and see, hey, how is this thing going to do uh, when it sells, you know, if, if they're doing value add strategy or whatever. But, you know, you're banking on the sale. And, um, you know, the return of capital thing kind of gets me a little bit, yeah, I don't like it very much, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so RV parks, you know, never mind that. We're getting the, we're hitting the pref. Generally, I mean, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but we're putting the trip to prep and we're getting the split on top. So that's kind of a nice, it's just, it's just different. And, you know, I think, you know, you could go take a crash course on mobile home parks. You can go to, you can go to, you know, pick, pick what weekend course you want to go to on multifamily investing. They're everywhere, you know, tons of Facebook groups, tons of this. And there's just, you know, just, there's a lot of buyers and a lot of competition for the space. And we're just trying to look for the diamonds in the rough. And uh, we found that in the RV park world. And in storage too, but that's uh, you know really kind of what's what's been uh, beneficial to us. That's outstanding, man. And now the, for people who are listening, there is a difference between an RV park and a mobile home park because I think initially people are, are thinking like a trailer park kind of kind of thing that you walk that you, you drive by in the areas that's got that bad stigma to it. Which again is another point that people starting out I think are very concerned with. I wouldn't live there, so I don't want to invest there, and it's the complete <laughs> wrong attitude because. Yes, I might not necessarily want to live in a trailer park, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't buy one or own one, just like some of the buildings or the houses. So um, are you having any issues when you go to raise capital and you tell your investors, hey, I'm raising capital before a storage unit? Because some of the times that I've talked to cities about owning or, or, or building units, the, the stigma that comes with that is they're very ugly and the city doesn't want those there. And then you have to show them that there's they're not all those big orange buildings that you see, see everywhere, but our investors, sure. oh no, I don't want to invest in a storage park or I'm sorry, in a, in an RV park. No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we haven't had any, we haven't. So I, I will, I will tell a funny story of about two years ago. So, you know, we were developing luxury condos in Washington, DC. Uh, that's a very kind of niche, um, you know, kind of 
sexier thing to do than buy RV parks. So when we made the hard shift from, you know, raising capital from building our uh, condos to an RV park in the middle of nowhere, Texas, um, there was some explaining to do. (laughs) So it was kind of like, okay, this is different. Uh, It definitely was a hard shift, but, um, and that first raise for the RV park was very difficult. It was um, a lot of explaining, conceptualizing, you know, showing what the demand was, showing what the opportunity was. But the last RV park that we had a capital raise for, we put together $3 million in about four days. Um, it was the, it was one of the fastest, uh, um, it was one of the fastest raises that we've ever done. Um, and it's because they cash flow and it's not a return of capital. It's none of these semantics. It's you're getting a distribution, <laughs> um, you know, return on capital and you're getting, um, a split, you know, at the end of the sale and getting, um, you know, a pref and, and, and all your money back at the end. Um, hopefully if the project goes as planned, um, it's always a projection of course, but that's, you know, that's basically, you know, I think what's made it so attractive is people are looking through a lot of these multifamily deals and looking through storage deals and yeah, you're going to get maybe a six to 8% coupon, you know, every, every quarter, right. You might be doing okay, but on the RV park investing, it's, it's that or more. And, um, I think people go, wow, this is great. The other thing I wanted to bring up too is something called cost segregation and bonus depreciation. So multifamily, a lot of your purchase price gets wrapped up into the buildings and those go into 27 and a half year life. And they go, they take very, very long to depreciate. So you're not really getting a lot of the depreciation. Then you have building contents and land improvements uh, and you can do cost segregation. And, you know, usually you can deduct about 20 to 30% of the purchase price and then you do bonus depreciation, which allows you to take 20 to 30% of the purchase price and depreciate everything in the first year. RV parks, it's like 70 to 90% of the purchase you can depreciate in the first year because there's no buildings. So there's no life entered into the longer, uh, longer term life. Everything, contents and land improvement. So <laughs> a funny example is we paid 2.3 for one of our parks and the land value is nine hundred dollars. <laughs> so everything. <laughs> so there's a little office, you know, maybe a hundred grand or something, but everything else goes into short-term life and gets bonus depreciated. So not only do you have the high cash flow, but you also have no taxes to pay while you hold the investment because you have all that bonus depreciation to spread out over the life of the investment. And I know the follow-on question to that is, well, yeah, Ryan, well, isn't there? Isn't there? recapture taxes. There absolutely is for any asset class, but that's deferred, you know, and it could be deferred for the entire time that you're owning the asset to it sells. And it's always paid at a flat 25% recapture rate. So you're still coming out way ahead without paying any taxes on the cash flow. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to do it. And, you know, again, there's no, it's not easy to learn how to operate them. There's not a lot of property management companies out there. There's not a lot of education and training. I think there's like three books and the one book I bought was pretty bad and it was like $90. (laughs) Um, You know, when we were learning this asset class, we just ordered every single book we could get our hands on on Amazon. And there was one and it was really bad. It was like $90. It was really expensive, but they probably know that they're the only book out there on RV park investing. So uh, maybe we need to rewrite a book. I don't know, but uh, (laughs) yeah. yeah. Nice. And so if if these are actually considered automobiles, they're considered property. You know, sometimes with RVs, there's a difference, right? Yeah, these are personal property. I mean, these are, you know, they're vehicles, you know, recreational vehicles that come in. Usually their fifth wheels is pretty typical, but these are nice rigs. I mean, the, the, the tenants that we have in Texas are, you know, these are mostly energy and oil workers that are bringing in, um, you know, rigs that, uh, that are expensive. I mean, these guys are making good money. They're making 150 plus thousand dollars a year to work out in these harsh conditions. I mean, so the, some of these rigs, I mean, with the truck and the trailer, it's like a quarter million. So it's not like these are just, yeah. I mean, these are, you know, brand new, you know, dually, <laughs> you know, F three fifties, you know, I mean, these are nice trucks, you know, coming in, um, you know, or just, you know, higher end trucks with, with trailers that are all tricked out because the problem is there's just no housing, you know, that no one's willing to build, you know, take the risk and building, you know, a bunch of single family homes in some of these areas. And so RV parks, our way of life. 
So you kind of, kind of got to see it to believe it. And that's kind of how we got into it initially. That's really cool. I like that. And you're absolutely right. I mean, in a housing shortage, but especially, I think that you're in a great place where when funding starts to dry up a little bit, that's still a really good recession proof strategy to hedge your bets a little bit that you're probably not seeing the dips that you're going to see on a residential when the, when the market starts to turn. Absolutely. I agree. So what type of, what's the exit strategy? I know, I know you're raising money. I'm assuming you raise money per project. Um, and I'm sure there's investors that you have lined up for, for when those projects hit. But if you're going to raise money for an RV park, and I know you're looking at certain things, certain cash flow, obviously most of them sounds like they're cash flowing as soon as you purchase them, which is good. Now, what's, what's the strategy? Are you doing something like you said, you can add extra parcels on there? And then are you going to a bank and pulling a refinance out like you would in like a, a single family or multifamily strategy? Yeah, so um, most of these parks we buy with cash. So, um, you know, when you, when you have a 16% cap rate, you've essentially got a 16% return on your money the day you buy it cash, right? So, you know, you can find in an, you know, if you think about, if you went investors and you said, hey, you know, I'm going to charge the project $100,000 to close it. And then, and then the property is operating at a 16% cap rate. You can give your investors a 16% return, you know, thereabouts right off the bat, right? I mean, it'd be a little bit less than that because you take your fee, you kind of load your fees into the deal. But I mean, it's pretty easy to cash flow with that. So, um, you know, leverage again is a difficult thing. Uh, we've had very low success with getting loans. And, you know, the, the problem with that is, you know, our company's size, you know, we, we don't really qualify for the SBA, but borrowers going to the SBA, uh, the SBA doesn't lend on housing. You know, a lot of people don't realize that they think, Oh, I can just get an SBA loan. They don't lend on housing. And also SBA loans takes like three months to close four months. Um, if you're lucky. Right. And then some people say, well, you can do USDA loan. Um, and that would, that would suffice. And that has really long-term amortization plan on five to six months. So if you have a buyer or a seller of an RV park and you're going to them and you're writing your contract in a way, make sure if you're going for USDA financing or SBA financing, make sure that you're giving yourself like six months in the contract to get that taken care of. Um, now if it's short-term rentals, you can do SBA, but if it's long-term housing, like we have, you cannot do SBA because the SBA will not lend on a housing project. Um, it has to be, yeah, it has to be, uh, more than, I think it's like more than 50% of the park has to be on short-term rentals. So that's, that's kind of a nuance and, you know, it's solid advice because if you don't know that going in, you can waste a lot of time going down the SBA route to find out that you can't do it in the first place. So, um, you know, local banks will do it. They want low amortization, you know, they want 10 to 15 year amortization, which is not very attractive to cash flow. Um, because there's not a lot to collateralize against. So what we've done is we've actually just raised our own debt. So if you go to an invest your investor network and you say, Hey, I want to raise six to 8% uh, interest only paid monthly first position, personal guarantee or not. Um, and you do a, your own fractionalized deed of trust. You can actually record a deed of trust and a promissory note with the County and against the property on title. And you can make your own, you could be your own bank on owning these things. And that's what we've done. Uh, we've actually, we don't have any banks that lend on these. We have our own in-house investor network that funds these. And the investors love it because they're getting an 8% return, you know, interest only paid monthly. And it comes every month. And there's a lot of cash flow ahead of, you know, that they're ahead of because they're the debt holder. So just make sure you structure it right. You know, an attorney or a title company can help you write a deed of trust and a promissory note, but that's how we've been financing these things. Um, and, and then the equity obviously comes with cash. So how, what types of terms are you structuring? Cause uh, are they looking for a big payout in three, five, 10 years, something like that? Oh, and would that be uh, a refinance? Yeah. Plan? Yeah. So the equity, um, no, we don't really, there, there are triggers that if we did refi, we would owe them, you know, a certain amount of money at, on the refi. But really, you know, the, the, the refi um, is not really desirable because we want to keep low leverage on these. I mean, we're usually only leveraging them 20 to 30%. And that's another thing to a passive investor. It's like, I have all this cash flow and I don't, the property isn't highly leveraged. You know, some of these multifamily deals are very highly leveraged. So if you can't make payments, you could lose that asset very quickly. So, 
I think that's kind of really important to note is like, we're only, you know, I think on one property, we've got a million dollar loan on a five and a half million dollar property. So we're, we're like way under leveraged. Yeah. So, and another property we're closing on is um, we picked up for two point, well, we bought the property already. We picked it up for 2.3 and we're going to do about a million dollar loan to expand it. So, you know, and the property will be worth, you know, I don't know, more than that, you know, five plus million. I can't remember the exact value it was supposed to be um, when it sells. So, Really, the plan is high cash flow, you know, for five to 10 years, depending on the deal. And then when we sell, they share in the proceeds of the sale, you know, just like a multifamily deal that we do a split when the, when the property sells. So they get some upside on the sale and then they get the cash flow along the way. So um, how many investors do you have on an average project? Uh, for every million dollars we raise, we usually have about 10 investors. Okay. So we'll have, we'll have about, you know, you know, we'll have most of our investors, our minimums are 50,000. So most of our investors invest 50, but there's some that do like 500 or 250 or 200. So, you know, kind of makes an average about a hundred thousand per person typically. So yeah, we just raised 3 million for the RV park. And, um, you know, I think there's about 32 investors or something like that. So it's keeping with the average. That's awesome. And I can't believe the, the low loan to value you're in on those. So Again, if you have a, a nervous investor and they really, something happens, the, the market's not going to dip that you're going to lose 60, 70%. And it's not going to happen fast like it would with a stock that you're going to be broke overnight. Like you said, if you really needed to, something terrible happen, you could fire sell that off at 50 cents on the value to another investor and still make all the money back and probably still put 10, 15, 20% in your pocket. That's, that's pretty crazy. You're making me want to go do that now. <laughs> Well, and if you think about it too, I mean, from an investor span standpoint, this is direct feedback I've got, you know, we have an RV park that's been um, distributing 17% to our investors and we've owned it for a couple of years. So, I mean, he's gotten back 34% of his capital. So, I mean, and it's not a return on, it's a return or, or it's not a return of a return on. So he's still, we still owe him his 50 plus he's made 34% on top of that. So if you think about it from a risk perspective, I mean, if the whole thing fell apart, he's got 34% of his money back in his pocket. Um, you know, so even like you said, if we had to fire sale or if we lost a lot of occupancy, our economic occupancy on some of these is like 20% to, to hit, to break even or, or return a little profit. So when you think about it, multifamily, I mean, you've got to be up in the seventies and the eighties on some of these multifamily deals. And you've got to be hitting your rents and hoping that, you know, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm invested in multifamily. I don't think multi, I think multifamily is great. So don't confuse this with being multifamily being bad. It's just different. And, you know, and I think we're always, you know, in this market, we're all looking for yield as it becomes, you know, a very strong seller's market. Uh, prices are going up. Cap rates are going down. Lending environment is crazy. It's easier to find loans. Not, you know, I've seen, 10 year interest only assumable loans coming out of multifamily. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. I mean, three and a half, you know, 3.75% interest. It's really, that's great. And you know, you can really do a lot of good stuff and then know that you've got that fixed interest rate um, in an assumability. So you can pass that, that deal off to somebody else and they have good loan terms now. So there's, I mean, multifamily is a great investment, but this is just a, it's a different thing that not a lot of syndicators are doing not a lot of people in the space. And so that creates an opportunity. So it's awesome, man. I love it. That's, that's what keeps you in there for the long ball and thinking outside of the box, diversifying. I think it's really smart. Good, good job, man. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. The, yeah. The other class you're doing is a lot is uh, storage units. So storage units are a thing I see everywhere. I don't know a ton about them. Um, my only experience with them. And then you can kind of tell me, you know, branch off from there done a little bit different but i had an apartment building i already owned and there was some some land in front of it so what we were trying to do was figure out what could we do with the land in front of the apartment building and it was an area that was very high military high rentals so i started seeing that anything that wasn't an apartment building or basically a fast food place or a bank was a storage facility so i started going around to the different storage facilities and asking them how much of an occupant there most of them were full or almost full and then i said okay well would the owner be interested in potentially buying more or buying land that's already been entitled to build more storage units? And the plan was going to be to have the city approve that. And then I was going to sell off the plan, but that was part of what I was looking for, for just what could this be as Jared, you met, he was, he was helping me with that. 
And we were just asking those questions of what could this be? And it looked like, you know, military towns, rental towns were really, really big for storage units, which I'm sure there's thousands of other ones. Those types of things are when I started hearing the conversations of, well, we'd be interested in them, but they can't look a certain way because we don't want them to look ugly. And when I realized how popular they were and I started really looking out for them, almost like when you buy a car and then everybody has the car, I did see how they're snuck in there in a lot of these cities where I wouldn't have even noticed them because they're not the big bright, bright orange, what is it, storage for right. you or whatever those ones are. So Public. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. So talk, talk a little bit about that and, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, okay. So there's a lot of different variations here. So results may vary. Jurisdictions may vary. So when we buy an existing facility, there's no concern because it's there right now. There are caveats to that. You've got to be really careful in your due diligence. You may find that in order to expand the facility, you've got to go through like a site development plan approval and bond landscaping and do architectural design review and that might require you to uplift your whole property. You may have to do architectural features on what exists there now. So you may have to spend money on right-of-way improvements or money on um, architectural features or landscaping or anything like that, right? So it's, it depends. Some jurisdictions are like, yeah, here's a building permit, go build it. And you can do slab on grade metal buildings overnight, right? Um, and, and everything in between. Some uh, uh, you know, cities don't even have a zoning for storage. So you have to get special use permit or you have to get Reza to do the, to do the storage um, and go through strict design review requirement, public notices, public hearing, things like that. And you have the gamut, right? So it just depends on where you are. So in your particular case, if the city required you to go through some type of specific design review, that could be very costly to you. So again, when you're looking at these properties and you're like, wow, this seller is telling me that I can buy this storage facility and ex double the size. We have a facility like that in um, Colorado. And it's funny because the seller is an older gentleman. He's built it, you know, back in the seventies with his son and he sold it to us. And he, and he said to us, and you know, he's in his eighties and really nice guy. And, you know, he says, Oh yeah, I was down to the city not too long ago. And they said that I could expand my facility. No problem. And we're like, Oh great. Do you have any paperwork? And it was from 1994. And uh, it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, a couple of years ago. That was like, yeah, okay. 20 years ago. <laughs> Over 20 years ago. And things have changed since then, right? So these cities have very strict um, guidelines and it's very difficult. So, you know, if you're basing your numbers on being able to expand, you know, consider making the contract depending on, de dependent on getting building permits or rezoning or approvals because you'll spend a lot of heartache. Again, don't rush to a bad deal because then you might be clawing your way out of it. You know, the theory, it's kind of like the, um, the analogy is like burning your boats. There's that Chinese warrior who would always, you know, sail his boats in and then he would burn the boats. So you'd either have to win your battle or no retreat, right? So when you buy that property, you are stuck with it. So in your case, you're kind of in a good advantage because you can risk some money and some entitlements and some permit fees. You already own the property. You're satisfied with the multifamily. And it's just a bonus to put storage out there. That's a different situation. But, you know, you could spend anywhere from $25,000 to a half a million dollars to get your entitlements. Um, and we've seen that range. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. On one of our properties, uh, we're building a ground-up development in just outside of Seattle, a 700000 in soft costs. And that's not bad, actually, uh, for the size of facility that we're building. So you really have to know what you're getting into and know, you know, what it is. And it's all, it all starts with a civil engineer. I think we talked about that in my speech is, you know, when we, you know, in Maui, we talked about that, like, Hey, you got a property and the seller says, Oh, I can, yeah, you can expand it. Oh, I talked to the city and this and that that's, that's unverified information. That's, that's theoretical at this point. Right. So when you go verify it, you know, you want to get a licensed engineer to look at your site and go, Hey, looked at your site and there's easements all over it and you can't build anything, <laughs> you know, um, or go to, and the other thing that I made sure everybody took away was, you know, that's great that there is a clean site and you can build to your heart's content, but there's no demand in the market. So you can go build all, all that, spend millions of dollars adding onto your facility and <laughs> nobody's going to come fill it up because there's no demand in the market, right? So you're, you're those two things that you really got to have a handle on, or you could be signing up for millions of dollars on a loan and have no way to pay it. And so again, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time 
getting on airplanes, flying to different markets, looking at deals to find out 